active altruism? Who has heard about it before? Okay, it's a good portion. Uh, who has not heard about it? Don't, don't be shy, it's okay. Okay, okay, that's good. All right, so most of you have heard of it. Um, so you probably know the answer to this question up here, which is what is effective altruism? Um, effective altruism is a philosophy and a social movement that uses evidence and reason to determine the most effective ways to benefit others. Um, and it encourages individuals to consider all causes and actions and to act in a way that brings about the greatest positive impact based upon their values. Um, so I think, you know, obviously there's a lot of organizations and a lot of people out there that want to do good, um, but kind of what separates effective altruism from a lot of these other uh, organizations is that we're, we take evidence and reason very, very, very seriously. Um, and we think about sort of um, not just, hey, like I'm doing, I'm doing good. I want to do the most good I can possibly do. So one, one nice metaphor I've heard is, uh, you know, when you buy a computer, right, you don't want to just get like a mediocre computer or, you know, a, a computer that has three, three stars on Amazon. You want to try to be get the best possible computer that, that you can get. Um, so effective altruism, if you want to do good, especially if you have limited resources, um, you want to try to do as much good as you can po possibly can. Um, and that's sort of the, the, our perspective uh, coming with this. Um, so let me kind of take a huge step back. This is probably something that's fairly obvious to all of you. Um, but when you think about the you know, 35,000 foot view of human history, for virtually all of it, uh, basically all of humanity lived on the uh, equivalent of a current uh, US dollar uh, a day. So, you know, GDP per capita over here, if you can see it, is, uh, you know, around 400 uh, current US dollars per day. But then something crazy happened over here. Um, so let's zoom into this a little bit. So this is looking at uh, uh, 0 AD uh, to the present. So something, the, the crazy thing that, that happened here uh, was the industrial and scientific revolutions, which started in Europe and then spread to the rest of the world. And today, uh, average GDP per capita, we'll zoom in here a little more, this is from Google Trends, it's probably a little more accurate, this uses World Bank data. Uh, it's around, uh, this is in uh, current US dollars, it's almost 11,000 US dollars per day. So, you know, 1960, virtually, you know, the, the very grand majority of the world is living right, you know, right about $500 a year, and today there's this huge growth. So we're living in an extraordinary period of time um, when you consider where you are right now compared to like what virtually all of your ancestors have gone through. And you know, it's probably obvious, but I think it's something that, you know, people don't stop and think about a lot. Um, and I think that's helpful to think about when we're thinking about effective altruism. Um, and here's some other statistics, which is that uh, probably, I'm almost certain that all of us in this room are probably extraordinarily privileged. So when you think about uh, the 1% in the United States, uh, which is talked about in political discussions a lot, uh, to be in the 1%, you need to make $340,000 a year. I think this is from like 2014. Um, so that's a lot of money. You have to uh, be someone that, that pulls in a lot of money every year. But to be in the global 1%, it's only $52,000 a year. So most of your students, maybe some of you are in debt and, and uh, you know, to, to pay for your studies right now, but there's a good chance if you're here at Columbia University, at some point, probably in the near future, uh, you'll be within the global 1%. Um, and then, you know, the global 5%, I'm a PhD student, I'm living on a PhD, so I've been, I'm in the global 5%. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, it, 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 you know, it's, 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 you know, something we don't always think about, uh, but when you take a big step back and you look at this data, I, I think you, you will probably agree that, uh, we are privileged both temporally and spatially um, in terms of uh, the map, vast majority of human history and also uh, us here in, in this city, in this country compared to the rest of the world. Um, so kind of what this all means uh, is that today more of us can make a big difference than at any time in human history. Um, if you were one of those people that lived during the time of the long flat line at $400 per day, you might be able to make the lives of your tribe better, you might be able to make the lives of your family better, uh, but it'd be very difficult to, at scale, make the lives of others better around the world. Um, now, as you saw from those prior charts, that's changed. Um, so we have the means, um, and we also have the tools, and I'll be talking about this uh, the rest of the presentation. Um, so anyway, uh, I think what this means is that it's, it's very exciting. It's an exciting time to be alive. 
Uh, when you consider where you are right now compared to your ancestors, uh, when you consider where you are right now in this country with these opportunities compared to the opportunities that many uh, of, of the people around the world have, we're, you know, we're quite privileged and it's exciting that we, uh, we have the opportunity to, to do uh, potentially a lot of good. Um, so, choosing a focus area. So, uh, when you think about doing good and effective altruism, you think, okay, what, which area is an area that, that I think uh, I can contribute towards and do a lot of good? So, here's a very simple framework um, uh, to think about that. Um, so, the first thing is how important. Um, so, uh, kind of a way of thinking about this is that bigger is better. What's the scale of the thing you're looking at? What's the scope of the thing you're looking at? How many people are going to be affected? It would be really great if you care, you know, you cured a, a, a really rare uh, disease. Uh, you might improve the lives of maybe a few hundred or a few thousand people, uh, but but maybe there's another opportunity where you could improve the lives of hundreds of millions of people. Um, so this is uh, one thing that's that's pretty important. Um, another thing is how crowded is it? Sort of how neglected is it? Right. So if there's a ton of people working on something. Um, chances are that there's a lot of people already doing good work and already making a big difference. And if you add yourself onto that, yeah, maybe, maybe you'll be a, one of the people that can make a huge incremental difference. But in general, with these sorts of things are something called diminishing marginal returns. Um, so the, the chance that you'll be able to make a really big difference uh, might be slightly smaller. So thinking about how crowded it is and how neglected it is is an important uh, consideration. Um, and then also, how much progress can you make? And another, another way to phrase this is how tractable is it, right? So maybe the thing is neglected and it's important, uh, but uh, if it's really, really difficult to actually change anything or to make a difference, uh, that's something you should also consider when you're thinking about the causes uh, that you want to prioritize. So just these, you know, sort of three simple things are a very high level general framework for how effective altruists think about uh, choosing a focus area. Um, so now I'm going to go into some, some of the, the uh, causes that people that have thought a lot about this have uh, kind of um, uh, mostly agreed on. Um, so I'll go into some detail about these. So one is global health and development. Um, so uh, one thing that this really has going for it is that it's pretty solvable and the track record of, of working on and solving uh, problems related to global, global health and development um, is pretty good. Um, so this gives you a sense, this, uh, just you know, every year, six million uh, easily, child prevent, uh, or easily prevented child deaths happen every year. So it's a pretty large addressable area, or addressable uh, focus area. Um, and then this kind of addresses the, the, uh, you know, the uh, solvability. Um, deaths from measles, malaria, and diarrheal disease have been down by 70% since the mid 20th century. So we made a lot of progress. The 1970s, you probably know, we eradicated smallpox. Um, so there's a good track record uh, of us being able to do good work and, and making significant progress on this area. Um, and uh, this just gives you a sense. Um, so some fairly simple uh, public health interventions in developing countries have really, really, really good returns on investment. When you think about the number of lives you can save uh, per uh, the amount of money that you spend on the intervention. So these uh, estimates, they come from GiveWell, uh, which is a sort of EA-affiliated uh, organization. These are from November 2016. This is the link. There's a bunch of methodology that goes into this. So they're kind of rough ballparks. But their estimates are that um, for every 3,100 bucks that you spend on mosquito nets with this organization, it's called the Against Malaria Foundation, you're saving a life. So that's a pretty good return on investment. Um, this deworming, they think that this is incredibly good uh, um, return on investment, so $900 per life save. And then uh, this organization that deals with schistosomiasis, um, uh, which is a, a sort of a stomach diarrheal disease that happens in sub-Saharan Africa, it's happening more and more in Yemen uh, uh, these days. Uh, this has a, a $1,400 uh, dollar spent per life save. So as you can tell, there's uh, uh, some real opportunity here. And uh, you know you can be pretty confident that if you were to invest in these sorts of organizations, you could probably do a lot of good in terms of saving lives. Okay, so a second cause area that a lot of uh, people that have thought about this have agreed upon is animal suffering. So you may not know this, but there's 60 billion farm animals that, that are raised every year. Um, you know, compared to seven billion humans. I think I'm, I'm just recalling, but uh, if you look at the total biomass of medium to large 
uh, animals on the planet. Uh, it adds up, it's something like eight out of 11 is farm animals, I think two out of 11 is humans, and one out of 11 is wild animals. Uh, so the, uh, the number and the, the amount of uh, you know, farm animals that we're raising each year uh, is actually truly staggering, and, and many of us don't think about it. Um, so it's, uh, despite you know, the, the number of farm animals that there are, this is a pretty neglected area. Um, so there's 3,000 times as many animals on factory farms as stray pets, for instance, but uh, stray pets charities get 50 times as much uh, philanthropic funding. So again, this is just a very neglected area. Uh, maybe you know, your moral system is such that you're not as concerned about farm animals, and, and that's fine. There's a lot of other things to work on, but you know, there's good evidence uh, suggests that farm animals do suffer a lot, and, and they're capable of feeling suffering. So this is an area that, that many people think is uh, uh, an area where we can make a big difference. Um, so this is getting into the third thing, but we live in an extraordinary time part two. Uh, so obviously there have been a lot of, uh, uh, you know, things that have gone really well uh, over the last few hundred years in terms of people, uh, you know, breaking out of the Malthusian trap, uh, being able to live well above the level of subsistence, um, and uh, health outcomes have improved drastically, but at the same time, as our technology has gotten better, it has given us capabilities uh, to, uh, be sort of destructive on scales that were un, sort of impossible uh, uh, before. So this is the Castle Bravo test, which is from 1953. It was one of the first thermonuclear weapons uh, ever tested. And this, this thing is something like a thousand times the uh, firepower of Hiroshima. Um, so yes, we do live in an extraordinary time in many ways. Um, so here, so this general uh, cause area is uh, broadly called existential risks. Um, sort of really big, large-scale uh, <laughs> risks uh, that uh, affect all of humanity. Um, so you can think sort of the formal definition of this existential risk is um, risks where an out adverse outcome would either annihilate Earth-originating origi intelligent life or permanently and uh, drastically curtail its potential. So some of the things that could be this destructive are nuclear war uh, and then also future uh, uh, technologies, um, artificial intelligence uh, could be incredibly powerful. Uh, it could be really, really beneficial, but you know, uh, it could also potentially be destructive if it's uh, not carefully uh, uh, dealt with. Um, and then pandemics, both naturally occurring pandemics, as well as bioengineered pandemics, uh, which um, might be getting easier and easier to make as synthetic biology continues to improve. Uh, so, evaluating this cause area. So the scope, so as you can tell, th this cause area definitely has scope going for it, right? So if, you, um, uh, if one of these huge events were to happen, there's 7.6 billion people on the planet, uh, and it would uh, affect all or almost all of these people. Um, uh, and, you know, but it's, it's bigger than just, just that. It's bigger than the 7.6 billion people uh, on the planet. And the reason is that it could really affect the ability for people in the future to be able to live good lives and to thrive. So, you know, the human race has been around for 200,000 years. Um, the typical mammalian species lasts for two million years, right? Um, so by this, you know, just sort of ex expectation argument, you, you'd expect us to have 1.8 million uh, years uh, of continued existence as a species. Um, uh, but, you know, there's really no reason why. We're, we're sort of a, a special species, at least we like to think. We're very intelligent. In many ways, we're able to overcome some of the natural ecological uh, uh, limits that other species have had. Uh, there's no reason why we can't make it past the two, the two million years. The Earth is probably going to be inhabitable for 500 million to a billion more years, uh, depending uh, on when the sun starts to expand uh, significantly. Um, and, but you know, even beyond that, we could take to the stars and live many hundreds of millions, maybe billions of years beyond that. So this existential risk concept is really, really, really big. Um, it definitely has scope going for it when you think about current generations and future generations um, that could be affected. Um, neglectedness. Um, so I, I do think that this is in some ways neglected. Um, obviously, there's uh, you know a lot of people that work with the military and think about okay, how, how do you uh, make sure that there's not a nuclear war um, and, and things like that. But at the same time, when we think about the people alive now and all the people in the future, uh, those people they don't really get a vote. The people that are alive in 2500 or 2700, you know, there, there's kind of like an abstraction in our minds, um, and it's it's very difficult for us to to sort of 
understand how our uh, activity will affect them in the future, and also, um, you know, they, they don't really get a say in our decision-making processes. So, um, you know, there's $390 billion that are uh, donated every year to philanthropy in the U.S., um, but very, very little of that money goes towards uh, um, uh, cause areas that would be sort of under this umbrella. So I, I think it is somewhat uh, neglected. Um, uh, and then tractability. Um, so I think there's definitely concrete things that we can do to work on this, but I think tractability is probably the hardest part uh, uh, when we're thinking about existential risks. So there's a lot of organizations uh, that uh, work on this topic. Uh, there's one in Oxford called the Future Humanity Institute. Um, I'll be talking about some of these later. Um, there's the Nuclear Threat Initiative. There's a uh, Blue Ribbon Panel on Biotechnology. Um, open AI, a lot of people that are concerned with uh, some of the specific risks here. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I've actually, I was working a little bit with FHI this summer myself. Um, uh, so, yeah, there's definitely things that you can do. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the, the future is very difficult to predict. Um, it's hard to know uh, which risks will end up being, you know, panning out, which ones will, uh, you know, maybe, maybe there'll be another risk that happens first that was difficult to foresee. So, you know, the, I think there's definitely um, uh, it's there's definitely things we can do, but I think tractability is probably the hardest part of this. Um, uh, so anyway, and there's a lot of other things related to, to existential risks that uh, are going to probably affect the probability of this sort of thing happening. So how how much international cooperation is there? Uh, is there continued economic growth? How how destabilizing will climate change and migration be over the next few years? So it's a tough problem, but it's a very very important problem. So effective altruists are interested. In Okay, so ways you can get involved on this cheery note. Uh, so one is uh, with your uh, choice of career. Um, uh, so, you know, we, I've talked a little bit about phil philanthropic uh, donations, um, but there's ways where you can specifically work on some of these areas or perhaps another area that you think uh, is really important, uh, dedicating your career uh, to, to, to working on these problems. And that's, uh, we'll talk about this later, but this is sort of how I, I view myself. Um, so, one organization um, that you should definitely be aware of and maybe many of you have heard of is 80,000 Hours. Um, so they're an organization that helps you think about how you can use your career to work on the world's most pressing problems. Um, uh, they have a great podcast uh, uh, and they have a lot of great materials for you to think about how you can actually apply some of the things we're talking about here uh, to, uh, to your actual career in the real world. So there's uh, you know, a number of things you can do career-wise. You can do direct work. Maybe you work for some of the organizations we've mentioned. Um, you could work on policy uh, for governments uh, that that could affect um, you know outcomes with 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 some of the uh, the, the important cause areas. Uh, you could try to influence funding, so uh, funding sources. You know, Jeff Bezos just announced he's going to uh, donate two billion dollars. If you could help him, if if you were able to help to influence uh, some of the decisions that he's making, that could make a huge impact. Um, you could uh, earn to give. Um, so this is going to be related to what I'm talking about next, but the, the idea here is that um, you, you uh, work in usually a high, high paying job, and then you donate a, a significant portion of your earnings to high impact causes. And this is a way where you could uh, have significant leverage even without uh, directly working on, uh, on, on some of these topics. Um, and then you could you know, affect, affect opinion. So if you work for a, a journalistic out, uh, outlet, there's a guy named Dylan Matthews who works at Vox. Uh, who uh, just started um, uh, a new series on effective altruism. So he's getting some of these ideas out to uh, a, a much more general audience. So these are all things you can do with your career uh, to, to make a difference. So there's very definitely concrete things you can do. Another thing you can do is donate. Um, so uh, these are some organizations uh, that encourage people, especially coming out of college, uh, to donate. Uh, we have one for the world right here. So you guys encourage people to donate at least 1% of their uh, income to high impact charities, right? We actually also use GiveWell as our source for recommendations. Great. Yeah. So there, and then Giving What We Can is another, another organization. I think this was funded by Toby Ward like 10 years ago. Um, uh, also encouraging people to, to give a percentage of their, um, of their income every year to high impact charities. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, obviously if, if you, if you uh, are able to donate uh, money, uh, design tech trainings, you can have a big impact even if your career is not focused on, on doing these sorts of things. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the community. 
Um, so this, the general idea of effective altruism, you know, I, I think there's been historically uh, people that have had a lot of ideas that certainly overlapped with this. Um, uh, you know, think about some of the utilitarians in the 1800s. There's a philosopher named uh, Peter Singer who was talking about a lot of these ideas in the 1970s. There's a lot of people that have converged on this, but uh, as, as sort of a more formal uh, uh, movement, this started in the uh, 2000s, uh, late 2000s, with a number of academics in Oxford uh, that were thinking about these sorts of things and got together and decided to uh, more formally uh, start, uh, start a movement that was both a philosophy but also a social movement that actually tried to change things. Um, so now there are thousands of people uh, that are identified as effective altruists worldwide. This isn't just like our crazy idea here. Um, you know, I'm not, this isn't, this is obvious as you can tell, this is stuff that's been thought about by many people. You know, most of this isn't original to me. It's, uh, there's a big community of people thinking about these sorts of things. Um, so so that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and then uh, there's, I, I don't know what the number is, uh, but there's at least dozens of EA community and university groups around the world. Um, did you know what the number is? Last time I checked, it was over 200. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I was, so there's like this website, it's called EA Hub, it's like down. I, like the website's not working, so I was like, I, I was struggling to find this number, but I didn't want to overstate it, so I said dozens, but okay, so 200. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a big social movement of, of people around the world thinking about these sorts of issues. Um, and now it's just coming to Columbia. We formally started la last year, I guess, right? So, so that's exciting. Uh, okay, so th these are just some of the EA organizations. I'm sh you know, there's there's many that are not on here, so hopefully no one's offended if their logo is not on here. But um, <laughs> uh, so I've talked about some of these already. Um, the Center for Effective Altruism. Uh, this is based out of Oxford. I think they're also in Berkeley. Uh, they help to coordinate a lot of the uh, activities of the effective altruist community. Um, we talked about GiveWell. Uh, Future Humanity Institute is based out of Oxford, and I think I mentioned them briefly, but they. Um, think about uh, sort of uh, the long-term future and making sure that the long-term future is hopefully uh, a, a good future. So they think a lot about the, the existential risks, uh, things we're thinking about. Uh, the Life You Can Save, I think this was started by Peter Singer, um, and it's, it's thinking about uh, donating money to uh, really effective charities that help uh, with kind of that first bucket of, uh, of global health and, and development, uh, 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 you know, uh, topics in developing countries and, and hopefully saving a lot of lives. Um, the Open Philanthropy Project, this is a, a really great organization. They're based out of the Bay Area. Um, and uh, they, they have a pretty large endowment. I think they're, they're founded by Dustin Muscovitz, or he's one of their major LPs. Uh, uh, and um, uh, yeah, they think about uh, the, the places where they can donate th their, their funds, uh, where it'll have maximum impact. So they're very effective all through the line. Um, so other ones, uh, this is the organization I worked for this past summer. It's called the Global Priorities Institute. Uh, it's at Oxford. Um, uh, shares off, so these guys, these guys, and these guys all share office space in Oxford. Uh, so it's a fun, fun community there. And um, they think about the Global Priorities Institute, uh, thinks about bringing some of these concepts from effective altruism more formally into academia. So it's made up of philosophers and economists. I'm coming more from the economic side when I was working with uh, this group and thinking about, okay, how, how can you, like, in a very formal, really rigorous way, uh, Think about decision theory and, and, and uh, uh, various things like that. How can you think about doing the most uh, good uh, and, and writing academic papers focused on that? So um, that was fun working for them this past summer. Um, some other ones, Animal Charity Evaluators. So this is uh, an organization that's specifically focused on animal charities. I think they're having an event tonight that we uh, unfortunately <laughs> overlap with, so that's our bad. But uh, uh, yes, yeah, so a lot of great organizations. Um, and there's many more that are, uh, unfortunately, I didn't have to know. Okay, so Columbia Effective Altruism. Um, so uh, what, what, what are we going to do? So one of the things is we're going to have events um, that we're going to uh, put together, but there's also other EA communities that have a lot of events, in particular EA NYC. It has at least a thousand people in it. Um, and yeah, I mean, at least that, that are signed up for their emails. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, who knows how many are actually active. But the Facebook group is over a thousand people. So, um, uh, and I think I think you need to like get approved by the admin. I don't think you can just like willy nilly. Uh, but anyway, 
Uh, so yeah, they have a lot of events, including tonight. That, that their, their event is at the Animal Charity Foundation tonight. Um, and then there's a NYU EA group um, that I think will also have events. So you know, obviously, if you're part of us, uh, then you'll learn about all these other really fun, cool events in Goshen too. Uh, then we'll also have more informal discussions about careers and and a way to make a difference. Um, so that that that's a uh, you know, I think that's a pretty high impact thing to do. And then of course, socials, socials with cool people, hopefully that are interested in some of the same things and and being altruistic, uh, effectively. Um, <laughs> so so yeah. Okay, so, so some of my concluding thoughts. Uh, so, so one thing is, uh, you know, effective altruism, in my opinion, is it's, it's a journey, not a destination. I think that, you know, if you call yourself a group like effective altruism, right, uh, it could come off like, oh, I know exactly what's effective, I know exactly what's not effective. And, you know, when you work really hard, you pull together a lot of data, um, and, and, and you have a lot of supporting evidence for why, you know, your, your intervention or your, uh, um, you know, your, your cause area is a really effective cause area. You know, new information comes up all, all the time. Maybe many of the studies that supported uh, this, this old, uh, you know, intervention that you thought was really effective, like maybe there was errors in their methodology, and there's new studies that say, wait, that's not as effective. There's another area that's more effective. Uh, that's really, really important, I think. I think it's important to be aware uh, that, you know, epistemolo epistemologically humble and to be aware that, um, you know, uh, it's, it, it, just because we think that this thing is really important now, like, it's really important to be open uh, to new evidence, uh, so which ties into this one. Being open-minded and fact-based is, is really important. Um, and I think that also ties into the community. I think, in general, the people in the community try to be quite open-minded, right? Because maybe some of these things I've said, like, it's, you know, one of the, the criteria is neglectedness, right? So, um, uh, you know, if it's neglected, there's a good chance that, like, a lot of other people aren't thinking about it either. So, like, to many people, some of these things uh, might sound like, oh, like, that's not really, that doesn't really fit with what, what I've historically thought. So, um, you know, being open-minded is extremely important for that reason as well as for, for this first reason. Um, uh, and then also, a, a final point is that, you know, like, it can be, it, it can sound like, oh, I want to be an altruist, I want to help people, like, maybe some people think that's kind of a drag, like, oh man, you gotta, like, spend your whole life being so worried about, like, people dying, like, in countries that are far away from me, or being worried about all these future people that, like, you know, are, you know, the choices you make today will affect, like, that, you know, that can seem kind of, like, burdensome and kind of, like, a drag, and, but, you know, from my perspective, and maybe I'm just more of an optimistic person, um, I talked about the, this at, uh, at, at the beginning, but there's, like, a lot of serious problems in the world, but not only that, like, we, in this room, are, in this room, and in many rooms like this uh, around the world, we're uniquely suited, um, or not uniquely suited, but we have the ability uh, to work on these issues and actually make a difference with them. Um, so the fact that we're here at this time in this place, uh, being able to work on these things is really cool and exciting because chances are if you had all the people you know that were ever alive in the world, it's like 45 million people, and you randomly placed yourself, chances are you'd be working on a farm like you know, barely able to stay alive, or you, you know, it, your life would probably suck. But here we are, and we have the ability to make a big difference. Um, so I think that's pretty cool and pretty exciting. So I try to, I try to keep that, uh, um, you know, thought in my head. Um, so now we're going to briefly talk about, uh, at least three of us are going to talk about, uh, very briefly, maybe like a minute or two, about like how we got involved with effective altruism and like our, our sort of thoughts. So, uh, yeah, Colin, you, sure. can, you can start. So I'm Colin. Uh, I originally got interested in uh, effective altruism two years ago when I went to a summer camp called Spark. 